How many of you have read this book, The Shack? How amazing. This book is extraordinary. It was originally written, William Paul Young's wife asked him to write a book for their six children to explain a little bit about what had happened in his life. She expected it to be between four and six pages long. He produced this in a ring folder, 15 copies for family and friends. Family and friends thought, I want my friends to see this. And so they started photocopying it. Eventually, in 13 months, they sold from a garage over a million copies. <laughs> 26 publishers had turned it down. When he sold a million copies, they said, oh, maybe we'll publish it after all. <laughs> since then, it has been, and this has never happened before or since, for 49 consecutive weeks, it was the number one bestseller in the New York Times bestseller list. It's gone on to sell 20 million copies. It's about to be made into a feature film. The trailer is out. It's going to star Oprah, Oprah Winfrey is the main role. <laughs> and um, so it's an extraordinary, extraordinary story written by an extraordinary man. And he's here right now. Would you give him a warm welcome as he comes to us? I love it, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. So, Paul, I mean, this book, in a sense, is all about your life and the struggles that you had. Just tell us a bit about that. Ah, uh, good evening. Mm -hmm. I'm catching my breath a bit. Um, there is no such thing as an ordinary human being. And uh, C.S. Lewis pointed that out, and I think he was absolutely right. Th all of us are extraordinary, but most of us don't know it. And, uh, you know, you look at our story. I think every human being is a story, not just has a story. I think every human being is one, and every story matters. Um, I think that's why we have such an affinity with story, is because uh, story has a way of climbing inside of the precious places of our hearts without asking for permission. And uh, creative work generally does that. It creates more space than it uses up. And, um, and I love that about story. So when, you, when you're with someone and you begin to hear their story, you're really on holy ground in a lot of respects. You're not dealing with just humanity that is created out of the ground, but you're dealing with the activity of God and a God who is a burning bush who doesn't require, you know, the, the bush itself to maintain the fire of his affection, but is, shows up in these holy ground places. Um, so my, my story is holy ground, like your story is. Um, in some respects, it's on the surface, ordinary. On, in some respects, it's not normal. <laughs> well, who knows what normal is? So uh, I'm, uh, um, I grew up inside pretty fundamental Protestant uh, traditions. I was, uh, I was born in Grand Prairie, Alberta, in Canada, and when I was 10 months, thank you for the, mm -hmm. I was there one time for two weeks. <laughs> I have never been back, but they have adopted me as mm -hmm. the town mascot. So, um, I grew up really overseas. Um, when I was 10 months old, my mother and my father and I packed up everything that we owned, and we moved to the highlands of New Guinea, where my parents were pioneer missionaries for a Protestant denomination. And um, there is uh, really incredibly wonderful things about growing up in that kind of world. There are some really difficult things about, uh, at that time, particularly in missions, where there was a sense that as a parent, you needed to be willing to sacrifice your child on the altar of God's purposes and God's mission, and uh, a lot of my generation were dismantled in the name of the gospel, and uh, very hard, very, very great sadnesses. Um, New Guinea is, uh, has 800 and plus unrelated language groups. We were part of a tribal culture that had never seen a white person before, which was not a problem until I was six years old and went to boarding school and found out I was one of those. And uh, which was a huge disappointment, and, and uh, 
um, created some real identity issues for me because I, at that point, I lost everything. At six years old, I lost my tribe, I lost my family, I lost, because I didn't know where I belonged after that. And that's part of the struggle that sometimes third culture kids have, missionary kids and army children and, and business people that grow up in different cultures. And, and um, um, I had uh, a couple other great sadnesses, including um, a difficult uh, relationship with my own father who came from a broken background and was part of a generation that didn't know they had baggage and wouldn't have known what to do with it if they'd known they had baggage. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he was a very angry young man who didn't have the chip for being a dad. And so I learned early and often not to have anything to do with this human being because it was too dangerous to be anywhere near him. Um, and then uh, sexual abuse was a part of my childhood. It started in the tribal culture, um, and it was uh, often, and it was incredibly um, heart dismantling. Nothing quite dismantles the human soul like sexual abuse. And, um, and my parents didn't know. They didn't have uh, an awareness or a sense of it, and sometimes it was happening within 10, 15 feet of them. And, uh, but it was a dominant part of my childhood. At six, I was sent away to boarding school, a Christian missionary boarding school. And the, and the first nights, the big boys came and uh, molested the little boys. And so it just became part of the unraveling part of my heart. You know, there are things that as children we don't we don't have any control over. And as children, we don't have the ability to process it. So we think that everything around us that goes wrong was our fault. And, um, and the, part of the question is, where, where is God when things were stolen from me? You know, where, was, where were my parents? And, and then as we grow and we create these survival mechanisms and skills and and we have addictions that show up inside our brokenness because we got to have something that eases the pain or fills this emptiness or some way that we can find a way to love ourselves. This is one of the attractions of pornography is, is we can control a relationship without having one. You know, there's no risk involved and we can't be rejected and it's, it's part of this hugely terrible addiction. And... Um, and so, you know, I began to turn around inside the brokenness of my childhood, and I began to break things. Uh, I broke relationships. I, I betrayed trust. I continued to hide um, the truth about who I was, that I thought was the truth about who I was. Um, I became a performer. Because, you know, when you're a child, and everything, everything about yourself becomes trying to win the affection and approval of those who are around you. And if you come from a religious background, that includes God. So you're, you're trying to constantly figure out what people want so that you can be that, so that you might win some approval and affection. And then God has a whole list of things that you're told that he needs you and requires you to be in order to win his approval and affection. So it all becomes about performance. And, uh, and those of us who are broken become breakers. Um, and so... One of our big questions is, where, where was God when I broke things? You know, why, why didn't he stop me? Why didn't he stop them? And, and these are some of the questions that involve our, the deepest places of our humanity. And um, I learned to survive. I learned to walk the edge between giving up, which is definitely an option, um, I went to, we came back to Canada about the time I was 10 years old, and I went to 13 schools before I graduated high school. My father was an itinerant pastor, so he would take different churches, and we constantly moved. And uh, so I would say, you know, I never ran away from relationships. I just heard God call me somewhere else. You know, it's totally a cop-out. And um, um, because relationships is what did all this damage to me. Um, largely men, and, um, and yet 
relationships are what offered me any sense of possibility of healing my heart. So you're caught, and, and secrets become part of that whole um, broken place inside our hearts. And in January 1994, you got a phone call from your wife that was quite short but quite uh, important. One, one sentence. You know, and the shack is a description of the human soul, the heart of a human being. And it's the house on the inside that people help us build. And a lot of us, it's the place where we then store all of our addictions and we hide all of our secrets and it's a place of shame. And, uh, and the, my, my metaphor was that I took pieces of the shack and drug them about 100 yards outside the shack and created a facade a piece of plywood that I could paint as fast as I could pick up people's expectations. So I was a performer, right? I didn't want anybody in the shack because I, I was afraid and terrified that they would hate me as much as I did. And I couldn't take that risk. And I was hoping that if I performed right, per perfectly, long enough, that the facade might become a real boy, might become the real person. And uh, at some point, your facades have to come down, and it's going to be inside relationship. Um, I said earlier in one of the, one of the uh, times was, I, I wish I could say to you that I finally figured out that I was pretty broken, so I went and got help. <laughs> I didn't. Um, a lot of times, some of us were so broken that we have to get caught, and I got caught. And... Um, I married Kim mostly because I felt that, uh, this is a long story which I won't get into, but it was really, uh, in retrospect, the kindness of God because this woman paid a huge price for my healing when it wasn't fair to her. But she did it. And because uh, I, I drug all the brokenness into the marriage and she didn't know. You know, when, when you're in sort of the dating relationship, which I m made very short from the time I asked her to marry me, in which we hadn't even really dated, to the time we got married was 11 days. And, uh, and some of you will understand this. I wouldn't have made it 12. I mean, w once I asked her, here's, I'll tell you a side, little side story that's kind of funny, but, but I asked her in a group setting because I thought it would be safer. Men can be such idiots, let me tell you, just so you, in case you didn't know already. But, um, but I made these cards, and everybody had to read this little card, and I'm fairly creative, so I'd, I'd created a very, I, I created the party, and it was basically to ask Kim if she would marry me, but I put it inside a card, and you were supposed to read your card out loud without pre-reading it. And, and I palmed hers to the bottom of the stack that I shuffled up so that hers would be the last because I figured once she reads the card, it's either going to be, you know, the evening's over one way or the other. And uh, <laughs> so, so when she reads her card, she, she goes, because all I wrote was, will you marry me in the card? That's it. You know, it wasn't nothing poetic or wonderful. And she says, will you... Mm? <laughs> and Kim was here this morning. If she was here tonight, she would tell you that what went through her mind in that moment was... If I say no, he will never ask me again. But if I say yes, I can back out. <laughs> right? How brilliant is that? <laughs> so she said yes. And as soon as she said yes, I became suicidal. I am telling you the truth. Because I now put myself into a situation where I couldn't run away. I couldn't just leave. And... You know when you have a thin layer of perfectionist performance covering up an ocean of shame and people come along and they begin tapping through your performance and saying, you know what, you're not everything that you present yourself as? That's when you hear God call you somewhere else. <laughs> and Kim is, Kim is from a healthy family, not like mine, which is a religious family. And uh, <laughs> she, right? She, uh, she's North Dakota, Minnesota, salt of the earth, very expressive. These people are genetically enhanced to all talk loudly at the same time and understand each other, right? I come from a religious family. We hide everything. We lie about most stuff, and we have, a, we have an order of service when we get together. So, um, so I'm suddenly going to be living with a woman 
who has no qualms about tapping right through this shame. Let me tell you one of the most profound things that I learned about shame. Shame destroys your ability to distinguish between a value statement and an observation. Let me say that again and then explain it. Shame will destroy your ability to distinguish between a value statement and an observation. So when we were first married, I would, and in retrospect, in tongue in cheek, I would say, when we got married, Kim would tell me these horrible things. She would say horrible things to me like, don't mix the colors with the whites. <laughs> right? Can you imagine that? <laughs> it's laundry, right? She's talking about doing laundry. What did I hear her say? I heard her say, I don't know why I married such a loser of a human being as you. Because shame had destroyed my ability to distinguish between an observation, which she was making, and a value statement. See, this is a perfectionist performance mentality. I was only good as my last moment of perfection. And now I lived with a person who had no qualms about making observations about my imperfections. And I did, it tapped right into my shame. Well, I'm an adapter. I'm a survivor. I didn't tell her about all the damage in my shack. I didn't tell her about my addictions. I just found a way to adapt. And I didn't know how to love, but I'd read the books about it. And I grew up in the church, so, you know, I had a, a good idea, I thought. And I adapted. We have six children. Our youngest is 21. And, and shortly after he was born, January 4th, 94, I get a one-sentence phone call from Kim. And uh, all she said was, I'm waiting for you at your office, and I know. And my whole facade came crashing down in one sentence. Because what she knew was I was in a three-month affair with one of her best friends. And at that point, I had to make a decision whether to face Kim or kill myself. This little jump out of this and run away one last time before you hit the bottom kind of place. And I don't even know how I, I think it was the grace of God that got me across town and pulled into the parking lot into the business office where she was waiting for me. She'd already torn my office up. I mean, literally torn it up. You have to understand, Kim and her five sisters, she has five sisters and two brothers. Her and her five sisters are called the Force. <laughs> <laughs> and for the first four hours after I walked through that door, she took me apart. And four hours into this, I told her, if we're going to actually do this, I need to tell you every secret I have. And naively, she would tell you she was so naive. I mean, her world had come apart. And naively, she said, bring it on. And it took me four 10-hour days to tell Kim all my secrets that she didn't know. And at the end of those four days, Kim was destroyed. And she said, I will never believe another thing that comes out of your mouth the rest of your life. And I believed her. But I had hit the bottom. I'd stop pointing fingers at my abuse and, and uh, hiding behind my addictions, and I thought, I either have to find some healing or I'm dead. If I can't find some healing, it's over. So I looked in the yellow pages under counseling, and I found a therapist. I started with the A's, worked my way down, found agape, agape, which is the name, the word for God's kind of love, which is other-centered self-giving, agape youth and family services specializing in sexual abuse histories. And I called up, and I was introduced to a man who became my friend, Scott Mitchell. And for nine months, I mean, I sit in front of him the first day, and I say to him, Scott, my life is over. And for the first time, I'm 38 years old, and for the first time in my life, I say to another human being, Ken, you help me? To that point in my life, that was the greatest single risk I had ever taken. Because if the answer is no, 
why would I take the risk of doing this again? And one of your questions that you've asked me earlier is, can we get past this? Can we get through brokenness? Can, can we actually be healed from our addictions? And I'm here to tell you, absolutely yes, but it's not easy. It's hard work. And you can't do it by yourself. You have to begin to take the risk of trusting somebody. And, it, and part of that journey, I entered in, and I was with Scott for intensely nine months, and then we, we were friends after that. But my healing process, where I can mark it, was from January 4th, 94, to the end of 2004. And at the end of 2004, 11 years of dismantling my soul, 11 years of, of saying, I have no clue who God is. 11 years, and I tell, at, at the end of those 11 years, in 2005, I turned 50. But in those 11 years, I worked to the place where I could finally wipe the face of my father completely off the face of God. Because my view of God largely came through this difficult relationship with my dad. And we're all impacted by our histories and our backgrounds. The end of 2004, I was one of the healthiest people that I knew. I had no secrets, and I don't have any secrets in my life. There is nothing that Kim doesn't know. There's nothing my children don't know. There's nothing my friends don't know. I have no addictions, and I'm not talking just pornography and those kinds of things that just entangle us. I'm talking gold-chained addictions, like doing something to create significance, or pleasing God, or pleasing my dad. And I'm the same person in every situation. I'm no different here talking to you. Do I understand this shack? Do I understand, you know, I made 15 copies that did everything I ever wanted this book to do. This is all God's sense of humor, as far as I'm concerned. Hmm. I don't understand the purposes of God, and I don't want to know. It took me 50 years to become a child, I'm not going back to being an adult. It's too much work. <laughs> I like this living inside the grace of a day. I like being surprised. I like learning how to trust. And, and Kim took her 11 years to forgive me completely. It took 11 years for us to heal. <laughs> 11 years of putting one foot in front of the other, being consistent doing the work, the hard work. And she, for about four years at the end of this, had been saying, you know, someday, because I was a writer my whole life, in the sense that anybody is, you write stuff for your friends and family, and, and uh, you give it to them, and they love it because they're your friends and family. You know, poetry and songs and short stories. And, and she always loved what I wrote. And she said, you know, someday as a gift for our six children, would you put in one place how you think because you think outside the box. And when it got printed, she said, I was thinking like four to six pages. <laughs> and I wrote a story on the train to one of my three jobs. I had 40 minutes each way, and we had nothing. We had lost everything in 2004, which was part of the healing process. If you have the fear of financial insecurity, there's nothing quite like losing everything to help heal you. <laughs> and. And Kim was working at the high school bakery and we were living in a rental flat with about 900 square foot of space with six of us. And, and the joy of God had dropped on us. Joy had become a constant companion. That's what happens when you live inside the grace of a day. You don't run away from joy. You know, we are so geared to be future trippers. That's, that's what we do when we can't trust. We create imaginations that don't exist and we spend real grace that was given for us for today on things that don't exist. And I'd stop becoming a future tripper. In 2005, my prayer was, I had two prayers left. <laughs> you know, for a religious kid, that's not bad. My two prayers were this, Papa, I don't want to be an old man one day looking back at my life and wondering, what would it have been like to take the risk of actually trusting? To take the risk of relationship and community? I don't want to be that guy. And my second prayer is, Papa, I'm never going to ask you to bless anything that I do. 
but. Now, let me explain that first part. I'm a religious kid, so give me a dream, a vision, a word, or something. I'll turn it into an agenda. Give me half a chance, right? And I, my whole life has been like trying to get God to follow me. Hey, I got this great idea for me, for you. <laughs> I mean, look at what we could do, you know? And it's all a way to find identity, worth, value, significance, security, meaning, purpose, you know, in something you can control. And, and uh, I said, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm never going to ask you again to bless anything that I do, but if you have something you're blessing, and it would be okay for me to be a part of that and participate, I'd be all over it. And I don't care if I'm cleaning toilets, which was one of my jobs, or shining shoes, or holding the door open for others. I just want to know at the end of the day, you did this, and I got to participate. And you look at the shack, which is a phenomenon, which nobody saw coming, and it gave people a language to have a conversation about God that was relational, not religious, and it broke down all these walls, and it, and it found the precious places of people's heart, and in retrospect, I see God with God's great sense of humor goes, well, Paul, you know this little book you're writing for Christmas for your kids? What if I bless that? You give it to your kids and then I'll give it to mine. And that's what happened mm -hmm. to the praise of his glory. Mm -hmm. Amazing. <laughs> and this freedom that you've described, freedom from addictions, what does that look like in practice, and how, how does that happen? God, that's a good question. Well, how it happens is, like I said, painful and incremental. <laughs> and um, you learn how to forgive yourself, which is really the toughest journey. Um, it's one thing to forgive others. It's another thing to forgive yourself, to, to take your own hands from around your own throat. Um, it, it looks like changing your mind, which is the really, the biblical word for repentance. We have it associated with making more penance for stuff, which is not the idea at all. It means a radical change of mind. And God won't come in there and, you know, how, much, how many of us would love extreme soul makeover, you know? Like, please God, send me to Disneyland and fix me by the time I get back, you know? Or give me a red or a blue pill, right? This process stuff, I hate it, right? But it's because we are so incredibly crafted as human beings that this is not an easy, quick fix. And God is not going to become an abuser to heal us. You know that, that God doesn't heal you because he wants to use you? God heals you because he loves you. Mm. And then he invites you to play. This is a God who will never use a human being as a tool because you don't have a relationship with a tool. You understand? This is a God who loves you and is after you. He doesn't need the shack. He doesn't need the crossroads. He doesn't need a book. He doesn't need a movie. He doesn't need a song. You know, all those things are part of what he embraces and submits to because it's part of what we bring to the table. And he climbs inside of it and finds a way to get to us to our heart, to our affections, to our brokenness, and begins to heal us. So what does this look like? It looks like authenticity. It looks like where my inner world matches my outer world. I didn't know that was possible. I grew up in a religious environment where the outer world was always kind of a repression of the inner world because what I believed about myself at the core of my being was depravity or some kind of piece of crap. And it took a long time for me to begin to understand that Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father were telling me the truth of my being was that I was a very good creation and a new one. That that was the truth of my being. And so I could begin to live out of the truth of my being and I found that the way of my being matched it. As long as I believe I'm a piece of crap and I'm a, a, a depravity that's it? That's the truth of my being? How in the world am I supposed to get some kind of performance to match and, and keep that under wraps? I was, I was telling a group, and I think this is such a great illustration because it ties into um, what was a pornography addiction uh, up until 20 years ago. And um, 
And I said, you know the reason that I, I don't, I'm not involved in pornography and I have guards that are on my heart that are on the inside? They're not formulas for anybody else, but I know, I know what, what is right for me from the inside out. The reason that I'm not involved in pornography is because I know the truth of my being. And the truth of my being is that I do not abuse women, whether it's visually or in images or in any other way. I do not do that because the truth of my being is I care for the other. I am full. The nature of my being is other-centered, self-giving love. And I can live out of that. If I know that's the truth of my being, the way of my being begins to match it. If I think the truth of my being is just this brokenness, if I think that's the bottom line, then guess what? The way of my being will be full of brokenness. We've got to begin to hear the Holy Spirit tell us what the truth of our being is and then begin to live out of the truth of our being. That's our freedom in Jesus. Amen. And um, I, I love is a very key part, forgiveness and love are very key parts of um, the story of the shack and the, n the nature of God that you describe. Just, just in conclusion, say how that works out in your life now. Ah. When I talk about the grace of a day, that is really at the heart of how I live. It's the only way to deal with this. How do you deal with a book that, I mean, to tell you how nuts this is, The Shack is in the top 40 bestsellers of all history, of all history. That's how nuts this is. How do you deal with that? And, and, and you know, you don't, you stop becoming a future tripper and you learn to live inside the grace of a day and you learn as things occur inside that grace of a day, you forgive, you let go, you ask for forgiveness. Do you understand the difference between apologizing and asking for forgiveness? It's huge. You know, one of the things we wanted to teach our children was how to ask for forgiveness, not just apologize. Apology is just a declaration that I got caught or I, you know, feel bad for some unnamed reason. But asking for forgiveness changes power. I take the power and I give it to you. Will you please forgive me? See, that's very different than to say, I acknowledge I got caught and I feel bad about it. You know, that's just a statement. It doesn't change any power. But a lot of times we have to learn to give the other the power in the relationship and asking for forgiveness is one of them. It's a very key thing. So forgiveness and love, what is this love? Other-centered, self-giving love. Well, it means that this actually matters. If I have some view of humanity in which the self gets lost, you know, some kind of selfless love, it's a denial of who I am. If suddenly there is no self, there is nothing from which to love. That's not God's goal. The God's goal was not to empty Jesus so that when you looked at Jesus, you just saw the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's point was to celebrate Jesus. Jesus never becomes the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never becomes the Father. And yet they're so intertwined and interpenetrated that the only real way to talk about them as one is one. There is one God, but it's three persons in this dance of other-centered self-giving love. We're created inside that to be expressors of that. This is why at the heart of our healing is relationship because there is no deeper reality of the character and nature of God than relationship, other-centered, self-giving love. And this is why John, who, is, who writes the last thing that's in your Bible chronologically, which is the Gospel of John, is the last book we believe ever written that was put into the New Testament. And he is asked, as an old man who has already seen the dismantling of religious systems even inside the community of faith, to write his perspective, and he begins with the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was pros, turned toward, face to face with the Father, and the Word was the Father. 
There is nothing that has been created that was not created in him. He begins with relationship. And that is the most profound place to begin to understand our relationship with each other, with God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with Jesus apart from whom we would not understand or know the nature and character of the Father and the reality of being anointed in the Holy Spirit as he is. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let me put one little piece on that that for whatever reason is important in this conversation at this time in this community that is gathered. This God, people sometimes have asked me, um, you know, if not the God that I have presented is too good. I have people who write me emails and say, I'm terrified that I take the risk that God is this good and I'm wrong. Because they grew up with the God that I did, you know, Gandalf with a bad attitude God. And um, <laughs> I believe in a God of fire and fury, just so you know. But I believe that that fire and fury is one way to look at this relentless affection and love that is pursuing everything in us that keeps us from being free. I believe that 100% of this fury is for us, not against us. And I'm talking about every human being on the planet, right? The reason that I, part of the reason that I believe that, I have a daughter, Amy, who is 26. For about six years, Amy has been at war with a micropituitary adenoma, a little brain tumor that's on the backside of her pituitary gland. We live in a world that's broken. Things are falling. And did you know that all of you are going to die? Mm. I, I, I don't know if that was a, you know, sorry to just, you know, mm. spoiler alert. But, you know, we're all in the process of the deterioration of our, of our physical mortalities. To take on a physical mortality indeed. But this one is falling apart. And, um, and we deal with sickness, which we're not designed for, or elements of death that we are not designed for. Because of this little pituitary adenoma, Amy began to entertain a lie that she was damaged goods. You know about these lies that come and begin to whisper, you're not worthy of being loved yet. Or because of this, you're not worthy of being loved. Or you've proven you're not worthy of being loved. You are an I am not. I'm not smart enough, tall enough, skinny enough you know, beautiful enough, I'm not, whatever, the I am nots. And Amy began to believe that she was damaged goods because she had a brain tumor. And because of that lie, she opened herself up to some very damaging relationships. She is, she is way past that, just so you know. But let me tell you, it was not an easy journey. And here's the point. I am her father. Give me the ability to be a flaming fire and go in and eradicate that little piece of tissue that has hurt my daughter. And even more so, to destroy the lie that hurt my daughter, I would do so in a heartbeat. Not because she has, what, failed to live up to my expectations? No. Because I love my daughter. That is the relentless affection of God. God does not desire is simply to cure sin and brokenness. His intent is to destroy it. Mm. Mm. Oh, Young, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.